So today we're talking about Equal Pay. We just passed Equal Pay Day, as you will recall, mm -hmm. uh, and we are planning for next year's, which will be just a little bit earlier, and we're moving it back as the pay gap starting to decline a bit, but still not to where we'd like it to be, and certainly nowhere near equality. We're going to talk about what union bargaining and what activism on the part of union women has to do with that. We're going to hear the latest statistics from the Institute of Women's Policy Research. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Janus case, which is now before the Supreme Court of the mm -hmm. United States. And no, that does not refer to the investment company. It refers to a gentleman who's brought a suit against AFSCME, which is one of our unions. But we're lucky to have with us today some very expert speakers. Um, not necessarily including myself, but Carolyn York, she just recently retired as the Director of Collective Bargaining and Member Advocacy at the NEA. Um, and there, are, She's NEA's current representative on the board of a group called the National Committee on Pay Equity. The National Committee on Pay Equity and I have been friends ever since I began working in the Women's Department at a, uh, AFT because Barbara Van Blake was one of the founders of that. And so I worked with them, and so I've known Carolyn, gosh, must be 10 or 12 years now, I guess. And then we have um, Elise Bryant, who is the executive director of the Labor Heritage Foundation and the recently elected president of the Coalition of Labor Union Women. And Elise is also a dear friend of mine because she's a director of the D.C. Labor Corps, which I am a vagrant member of at times. <laughs> yeah, you're not always there. <laughs> no, no, I'm afraid not. That's one Kirk fellow never recruit me. <laughs> you don't know. You've never heard her talk about if you can't even carry a tune in the bucket, just move your mouth and stand with us. <laughs> um, and we also have Elise Shaw. We're very fortunate to have her. She's a senior research associate at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, and she manages projects on women's political participation with special attention to the intersectional nature of race and gender on women's lives. And we all know that those intersections are there. Um, she works on workforce development and job training, um, and especially on the IWPR's continuing series of women in the states, where they actually analyze information about women by the state in which they live, which is, I think, extremely important, and something that our political pundits certainly could get a hold of and use if they would. Um, She's going to adjust the union difference in women's pay and the slowdown in achieving equity. And then you come to me, who's going to be talking about the Janus case um, and what its implication is for women in terms of these various areas that the other ladies are going to be speaking of. So with that, I'm turning it over to Ms. Carolyn Moore. Well, thank you, Connie, and thank you all for uh, putting together this great panel today. I was involved with this organization 
decades ago, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and honestly, I did not realize you were still going strong. And so it's wonderful to reconnect with all of you and to talk about what is definitely the issue nearest and dearest to my heart. Uh, when I decided to retire from NEA in, in January, I had one request, and that was, may I still please represent uh, NEA on the board of the National Committee on Pay Equity? And um, fortunately, they said, yes, that would be fabulous. And so I, uh, that's how I am using a small portion of my time these days. Um, like many of you probably, because I think I'm in my age cohort here, uh, <laughs> when I first began working on pay equity uh, in the early 80s, um, women earned 59 cents for every dollar men earned. And in fact, there was a song, which I ne uh, Elise and Connie could definitely sing. Um, and perhaps you remember it as well. Fifty-nine cents for every man's dollar. I, I should have brought my shirt today. Fifty-nine cents for every man's dollar. They gave you the diploma. It's the paycheck they steal. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. That is absolutely perfect in more ways than uh, just your and great singing, which I always love. Uh, today, 50 years later, we've made great progress, uh, and I'm going to pass out a fact sheet that you can look at at your leisure. It's from the National Women's Law Center, a wonderful group that's also very involved with the National Committee on Pay Equity, and they have a website that has a whole ton of different uh, fact sheets, so there's other aspects of this issue or other issues you can check out their website. Uh, they say that the gap is now 80 cents for every man's dollar, uh, which doesn't, isn't quite as catchy a tune, um, but it is significant <laughs> progress, but it is nowhere near close to equality. Uh, and if we continue to close the wage gap at the rate we're doing it, will be another 50 years, which will uh, put us well past the lifespan of pretty much everyone in the room, except perhaps you, Elise. <laughs> um, and so, although I'm sure your four-year-old would have something to say about that. Yeah, she's allowed to say about a lot. <laughs> um, so we clearly need to keep the heat on and do what we can to try to eliminate this discrimination more quickly. Um, if all, and many of you I'm sure were very involved in pay equity work back in the 80s, and that was really the heyday of pay equity initiatives. Many state governments examined their pay practices, they identified which jobs were dominated by women and or people of color, or both, uh, and they implemented adjustments to try to get rid of the pay disparities between the jobs done primarily by women and people of color, opposed to those, who were that, those that were done primarily by men or white employees. And these job studies, and I worked on the Wisconsin Comparable Worth, as we called it then, task force, that went through this process. And we looked at, um, within the workforce in that state or in that municipality. So we didn't look across employers, we didn't look at you know, what the market was for those different jobs. We looked and tried to establish equity within that workforce based on the skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions that were required for those positions. Um, most of those initiatives occurred in the public sector. I will say our CWA sister here, there was also quite a lot of work within the newspaper industry, which was private sector. Uh, <clears throat> but for the most part, it was within the public sector, and it was where their employees uh, had bargaining rights and were organized. Um, 
unions and in some cases other groups push to um, uh, have lawsuits take a look and see if they could declare that the pay disparities violated Title VII. Um, and there were some positive decisions, but ultimately the court decisions uh, did not land on our side. And I think that dealt a major blow to the pay equity movement. Uh, we then focused very hard on trying to pass additional legislation that would more clearly establish that pay inequities of the kind that we were looking at were a violation <coughs> of Title VII or to pass new legislation that would take care of that. Um, and I think that one of the big factors is that courts really looked at the market, the almighty American belief in the market, which I'll come back to at the end, and said, no, if an employer can hire that um, worker at a cheaper price, then they can hire that male worker over here, then there's no reason that they have to pay the female worker and the male worker um, similar amounts unless they're doing the same job. And so we all know there still are many equal pay problems that exist. Uh, we do have the Equal Pay Act that allows you to get some remedy for that. But the whole issue of pay inequities between jobs dominated by women and those dominated by men continues um, uh, because the sexism inherent in that continues. Um, so we now see from National Women's Law Center, you can also see there's been a lot of look at the wage gap over the course of your career. It gets wider over time. They look at education, job choices, every other factor you can imagine. And the reality is women make less than men, uh, often in the same job, but particularly when they're in jobs that are primarily done by women. Uh, and these inequities continue into retirement because we all know that if you're lucky enough to have a pension plan, which is far too rare these days, uh, that is going to be based on your pay when you end your career. If you have a retirement savings account, the amount that you put into that is, is going to be based on what you had available from your paycheck to put into uh, retirement. And so uh, these inequities follow people throughout their lives. Um, Teachers are a very interesting example to me for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, I've worked with teachers for the last 15 years. Uh, and I saw a lot about the impediments to fair pay and how some of these aspects of pay equity that we're talking about really uh, worked out in the case of this career. Teaching, it, you know, there are many examples of jobs where at one time they were male dominated and then they became female dominated and the pay really drops. And there's, there's a great quote about how they, that happened in the case of librarians. Yes. Teaching is an unusual case because since there wasn't a public education system in this country until about the mid-19th century, the jobs that, that existed for teachers were really more private tutoring situations, very small academies often for men, for boys who were um, in I would, what I would call the upper class. So teaching as an occupation really didn't take off until the mid-19th century. It was about the same time that some colleges were starting to admit women, and teaching pretty much was always a female-dominated occupation. And today, three-quarters of all public school teachers are women. So that, that really hasn't changed. Um, 
it used to be pretty much the respectable occupation that a woman could be in if she wanted to work uh, outside the home and wanted to get an education. Um, and it often attracted the very top women students. Uh, interestingly, I looked back at the um, top 10% of my high school graduating class. Uh, 1971 is when I graduated from high school. And of the women in the top 10% of the class, there were, the, there were a very significant proportion of the women that became teachers, which I'm sure is not the case today. Women have so many more opportunities open to them some do choose to become teachers. Thank goodness we need uh, great teachers. And that's the thing about female-dominated jobs. Nobody may want to pay them what they're worth, but Lord, we need those occupations. It's not like every woman should go out and find a career in a previously male-dominated job. And then what are we going to do with... Um, all that work that needs to be done. So teaching is a great example of that. I also think, I don't know if any of you have been in a classroom recently, but teaching is was never an easy job, and now it is brutally hard. Um, there are a great number of uh, legal requirements, uh, the emphasis on testing, the scrutiny of teachers about how the scores that their students get on tests, um, it's pretty daunting. Um, the, need I say, the dreaded No Child Left Behind Act and what that did to um, the morale of teachers. Um, so it's very challenging. Um, now, I, about if we look at the history of pay inequities, the Equal Pay Act didn't really help teachers that much because they're all women for the most part. Uh, yes, now maybe a, a close to a quarter aren't, but for the most part they are. And teachers have for a long time been paid what by what we call the single salary schedule, meaning if you have this degree and this years of experience, you get the salary. That's very effective in rooting out sex discrimination and race discrimination. Now, it hasn't been used that much with uh, sex discrimination because, again, there are so many women, but it was a major help when uh, the after desegregation occurred and a lot of the uh, schools that had primarily, who had been black schools became integrated schools, black teachers were melded into, and with white teachers into a workforce and the single salary schedule was what said, regardless of your race, if you have this degree with this years of experience, you should get paid that much. So that has been a huge help uh, in the teaching workforce. Um, in terms of pay and pay equity, like we did it in the 80s, didn't really do much for teachers. There weren't really studies that looked at it because there were no comparable positions. You look at public schools, the male-dominated positions tend to be custodians, groundskeepers, it used to be bus drivers, not anymore. Um, so there wasn't that sense of we can compare ourselves to other occupations. So that really didn't have much effect, although it has been somewhat helpful for what we call education support professionals. And Connie's just you know, moving me along here, which is good. I appreciate <laughs> no, that. The other thing I would mention is that teachers are extraordinarily altruistic, far more. I came to the NEA after decades with other labor unions, and when I heard teachers talking about how they would not want to raise if it meant 
that children didn't get this or that. I was dumbfounded. I, honestly, I was like, come on. I mean, you deserve a fair wage. You deserve a secure pension. And they know they do, but it's very, very difficult to ever say, I want to put me and my job out front. Um, there are also, there's also always a funding issue for schools. They always compete against Medicaid funding at the state level. And, you know, so many things will push uh, down funding for schools. And then you do find, well, we don't have the right textbooks. We, our desks are falling apart. All those things that then make teachers say, well, I'll take a little less so that we can have all of this. So, fast forward to today, and it'll be a very fast forward in the remaining two minutes. If you've been watching the news, teachers have been walking out. They walked out in West Virginia, mm -hmm. Kentucky, Oklahoma, Arizona, and I keep wondering which state will be next. Texas. You think Texas? <laughs> Texas. See, I have my vote for North Carolina. Oh, but Colorado is on Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Puerto Rico is happening Colorado. right now. Oh. Yeah. We just organized those teachers. Yeah. Um, but that, this didn't happen overnight, as you can well imagine. The frustration has been building over so many years. Um, the Economic Policy Institute, which is another great think tank, has been um, analyzing teacher pay for quite a while now. In 1994, teachers were paid 2% below comparable private sector workers. And they have a big methodology for figuring out what's comparable. Um, today, that gap has grown to 17%. Mm -hmm. So it's getting much worse. They also uh, try to counter the argument, well, teachers have better benefits than other private sector workers. And yeah, it turns out they do have somewhat better benefits. But even when you include them, it's still 11% gap with comparable professions. Average teacher salary is now somewhere around 58,000, but that, and that's slightly below the national median salary, but that's all workers. Teachers, uh, more than half of them have master's degrees. Two thirds have more than 10 years of experience. Uh, so it's pretty bad. Um, and uh, Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, another great group, has looked at what's going on in some of these states, particularly Arizona, um, Oklahoma. Uh, those states have been giving huge tax breaks to big businesses at the expense of education funding. And now Arizona schools are the second worst funded in the nation. Oklahoma's are fifth. Uh, this has led to huge teacher shortages. 60% of teaching positions in Arizona are vacant or filled with people who don't meet the standards. Uh, it's common for teachers who live in states where they, they live near borders with other states they're constantly going across the border if they can find a better paying job or better working conditions in those other states. And Oklahoma, this one just blows my mind. 90 school, about 90 school districts now have a four day school week. <laughs> um, so teachers can work other jobs. Who the hell organizes their education system so that the college-educated career employees can go try to make a few bucks elsewhere on, on Friday? That's crazy. So, this is my conclusion. Um, I think a couple of things really stand out about this scenario. One is, it is still about children and the professionalism that teachers feel. That will never change, uh, nor should it. 
I, I've come to that conclusion after 15 years at the NEA. Uh, they, teachers will always focus on the needs in their classroom for textbooks, school repairs, everything else. And then when they speak up for themselves, finally, uh, they bring the voice of their students with them. And, and that actually is, in, I think, going to be incredibly helpful in the long run. Um, it's also clear to me now, pay equity can take many forms. I mean, I certainly am more of a traditionalist when it comes to thinking about pay equity. Uh, but this is a case where it's a profession without a comparable. And they found a way, I think, to speak up. The other thing I would say is that one thing we're learning now about, from the example of teachers is that the almighty market doesn't like to budge. Uh, at the be you know, I talked at the beginning about how courts were reluctant to tell employers that there was a, um, you know, that they couldn't have a, a market uh, exception to their pay policies. Well, you know, and, they, and there's this belief, you know, if you, the market will right itself. The market will take care of things. It will be even over time. Uh, and so, but what do we have today? We have workers in states, they, I mean, there are states where they don't have the workers to fill the job. They, the potential workers are going to other occupations. They're going to other states. Uh, some of the positions are being filled with unqualified workers. And yet, many of these states where the teachers have taken to the streets said, oh, solution, let's give tax breaks to corporations. Let's continue to starve education. Uh, and maybe this will work out somehow. So what happens in that scenario when you push these teachers, you push the profession, you push the children they care about up against the wall for so many decades? And what happens is teachers we walk out. Back. <laughs> so, Thank you. I apologize. No, no. <laughs> so I went ahead and said. Okay, Elise. Well, you know what? I think I can handle this if you can just right, right this way. Right this way? Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I'll move it over to a little closer. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Good. That was good? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. She's not looking at the monitor, so you have to listen to me. I will. I'm always a back director. <laughs> um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I've been working at the Institute for Women's Policy Research for almost six years now, and um, coming here today, I kept thinking to myself, oh my god, we have so much data on the issue of equal pay and the wage gap, where do I even start? And I really decided just to focus on some of our most recent findings, um, you know, and the analyses we've done leading up to Equal Pay Day this year. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of scratch the surface, I think, on the data that IDPR has and the analysis that we've done. As was said, we have our Status of Women in the States project. And um, you can actually go online to statusofwomendata.org, and you can find all the data, all the analyses. It breaks it down by state, by you know gender and race, as much analyses as we could do with the data. Um, so IDPR has done a lot on the slow march towards equal pay, um, and including that is looking at the union difference in women's pay, um, which is a publication that I recently worked on updating our fact sheet actually in advance of the Janus case, because we wanted to show that like the unions matter, and they're beneficial in many ways, um, not just for women, but for society at large. Um, but I guess I'll just start it off with kind of our wage gap analysis. So as we said, it's been about, you know, it's been more than 50 years since the passage of the Equal Pay Act, and there's still a gender wage gap. There has been progress. Um, in 2017, our most recent analysis of weekly earnings, full-time year-round workers, puts women earning about 81% of men's earnings, um, which is great. That's great progress from where we were in the 1980s. Um, However, most of this progress actually has happened in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, 
the, the progress on closing the wage gap and achieving equal pay has really slowed down. In fact, in the past 10 years, we've actually seen an uptick of only two percentage points in closing the wage gap. Um, in the past year, there was no change. So we're really seeing kind of this plateau and this stagnation of progress. Um, and so we're wondering, okay, what do we need to get going again to make sure that we continue to see the progress that we've seen in the past? Um, I know I would like to see that. <laughs> I know I'd like to see that for my daughter. So we're really trying to kind of delve deep and continue to raise this issue up. Um, in fact, IDPR doing a simple calculation, a simple linear projection um, predicts that if progress remains the same, the wage gap will not close for all women until 2059. Um, and uh, we actually put out a quick figure recently on the importance of closing the wage gap um, and the importance of equal pay looking at millennial women. So just looking mm -hmm. at millennial women, uh, we have done an analysis. You can go online and download our quick figure. But for college-educated millennial women, they, the equal pay could cost them a million dollars over their life over their lifespan. Mm -hmm. So they could lose a million dollars in wages if things stay the same. Um, so really, again, the importance of tackling this issue is paramount. <laughs> That's a lot of money. <laughs> um, and these numbers don't account for the different groups of women. So when you break the data down by different racial groups, uh, the outlook is even work for your, worse for your average woman of color. Um, black women on average, again, this is our most recent data, so our publication that we just put out for Equal Pay Day, um, they earn 68% of what white men earn, and the wage gap for them uh, is predicted to not close for 106 years, the year 2124, and then when you look at Hispanic women, uh, they earn 62% of what white, women, white men earn, and the wage gap will not close for them until 2233, that is 215 years. And those are actually, those are actually kind of the best estimates. Like people come at us and say, oh, well, you know, you're not, you're just using a linear projection. And we're like, yeah, well, if you use any other projection, the wage gap never closes. Yeah. So we're actually trying to be like positive and say it will close one day. Um, so, it's really kind of depressing news to think about that. Um, you know, again, there are many factors, as Carolyn brought up, that go into the wage gap and why this is persistent across our society. You know, the lack of paid family leave and affordable childcare, which means more women take unpaid time off of work to care for children and their families. Um, and then the big one is occupational segregation. So, you know, women working female-dominated jobs and men working male-dominated jobs. Um, in fact, 38% of women in the labor force work in female-dominated occupations. And only about 7%, so 6.6% .6 of women work in male-dominated occupations. And again, this is big because the women's jobs are usually paid less. Um, we put out a publication that I co-authored uh, <laughs> on low-wage female-dominated occupations, and it sh really shows you, you know, when you line them up, maids and janitors, janitors on average earn more. In fact, we um, pay uh, parking lot attendants more on average than we pay childcare workers. So we pay people more to watch our cars than we do to watch our children. Again, it's this kind of pervasive, sexism that goes into what is the value of women's work. Um, our, again, our re most recent publication put out found that eight times as many women work in occupations with poverty, with poverty level wages. So women are eight times more likely than men to work in poverty level occupations. Um, again, particularly prevalent in education and child care occupations, the care of the elderly, and the care of the infirm. And these are all jobs that need to be done. Um, these are all often jobs uh, that require increased educational attainment for women, and they're still being paid less. So they have certificate requirements and educational requirements that actually put them at a skill level above kind of the comparable worth issue. They're, they're required to get more education, most likely with the debt involved, and yet they're still paid less. So again, women are really kind of taking the brunt of 
society and making sure society functions because you know we can't our elderly and our children and our you know people who are disabled need care you know if these jobs need to be filled um, so closing the wage gap and ensuring pay equity is crucial for all women um, in fact the IWPR has done an analysis that shows that if simply closing the wage gap so ensuring equal pay would cut poverty in the United States in half there's really nothing else that we found looking through all of our research that will cut poverty by that much. The one thing, like if you just focus on this one issue, you would cut poverty in the United States by half. So again, huge to tackle this issue. Um, and while providing like paid family leaves and making sure there's affordable childcare and enforcing equal pay laws and you know tackling issues like pay secrecy on the job are all important to kind of tackling this issue women need better pay and better conditions within the jobs they already have. Um, so this is where kind of our union advantage work comes in. Uh, union jobs, because the hiring, the pay, and the promotion policies are more transparent, women do better in these jobs. They're paid more fairly, um, and they're more likely to have benefits and better benefits um, than their, the women in non-union jobs. So our research on the difference between union women, we just look at union women versus non-union women, and we break it down by race as well. When we look at that, we, we find that women's median earnings are higher for women in unions than non-union women across the board. Um, on average, a woman's weekly earnings will increase by 30% if she has a union job versus a non-union job. Um, that's a difference of Four hundred and I mean, sorry, nine hundred and forty-two dollars a week versus seven hundred and twenty-three dollars a week, which is huge. Um, black women in unions earn twenty-eight percent more on average, and then Hispanic women who have the lowest weekly earnings actually see the biggest increase. They, on average, earn forty-seven percent more in union jobs than in non-union jobs. The the actual figure is instead of earning $565 a week, they earn $829 a week on average. So when you average it all out. So that's huge, it's a huge difference. Um, so, you know, increasing access to unions and union contracts and for women is a huge part of closing this wage gap. Um, we also, began. we released this union advantage fact sheet, and we wanted to kind of dig a little more into the issue of the Janus case coming up. And so we did put a little historical piece in there to say that unions are not just good for women, they're great for women. You know, women are more likely to have health insurance as well, so they're able to work and stay healthy. <laughs> um, I think that the figure goes from 51% of health women out of union jobs have employer-provided health insurance. That jumps up to 77% within unions, um, but unions have been on the forefront of pioneering you know, employment best practices for decades and continue to push for policies like minimum wage increases, equal pay issues that would benefit everybody. So really making sure that we don't undermine our unions and in fact we want to increase <laughs> union access for all workers is really central, we think, a central component to really getting at this issue. Um, and like I said, this is just like a really brief snapshot of IWPR's huge body of work. We've been running the Status of Women in the States project since 1996. So you can go back and see a whole historical record of how women are doing on employment and equal pay in their states as well as nationally, you know, for, for decades. Um, so, like, if you have any questions, please let me know. But that was hopefully a quick overrun of our most recent data. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So you should say that Heidi started working on that yes. in the 60s. Yes. So, yeah, Heidi Hartman, she's uh, oh, the fa our founder she and is president. She is economist for yeah, women. Yeah, but she, she, worked, she worked with Wynn on she the She did. Cases. And she, yes. I mean, she, that's one of the reasons why she started IWPR, is she yeah. thought, we need to get at this economic piece. We need to make it central to what we're doing. Doing. We need to really push the bar, and so IWPR is. This is Elise Bryant, and she is not only the uh, executive director of the Labor Heritage Foundation, but also the newly elected president of the Coalition for Labor Union Women. She is a tried and true, true unionist. She comes from Detroit, my hometown, and I know that her roots are in uh, labor in that town. 
and uh, I can't say too much more without waxing on, except that she's a great director of the DC Labor Force. Thank you, Connie. As you know, Connie is a Girl Scout, and she's always prepared. So whatever you need, <laughs> you go to Connie for it. And, uh, and as we sing in the, in the DC Labor Chorus, I am a union woman, just as strong as I can be. I do not like the bosses, and the bosses don't like me. Which side are you on? 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 Well, I know which side you all are on. <laughs> That's why we're here today, gathered as women, as feminists, as womanists, as uh, people who see that right now, in, in this time, in our, at this point in our history, in this country, we are pivotal <laughs> to what's going to be the arc of justice of, of history. Yes, arc right. of justice moving to right. justice, right? The arc of history. Okay, and so I, and you, you know, you can take the class, the teacher out of the classroom, you can't take the class without the teacher. So in preparing for this, I started looking around, because I, I love quotes. And two things inspired me. One was that I'm, I'm working on a curriculum for uh, unlearning racism, dealing with racism specifically in the labor movement, because we got our own house to clean up. And one of the things that was pointed out in one of the studies I looked at was that a major contradiction, moral contradiction, was, was right in the Declaration of Independence. That up until that time, slavery was a slavery. Nobody really talked about it. But once they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they created a moral dilemma. Because if all men, we know who they were talking about, the Protestant for the most part, land-owning men, um, meant that who were these people who were enslaved if all men are created equal? So then they had this like little problem with that thing, and so they came up with the Constitution with it. We're going to make them three-fifths human. But what about women? I said to myself, what, what was happening with women then? So voting was a legal privilege. It wasn't really in the law. So women could vote, and then I, I remember that that quote from Abigail Adams. So I had to go look it up, y'all, and I, I found it, and I said, okay, okay, what did Abigail say? She said, though we facilitate ourselves, we sympathize with those who are trembling least in the lot of Boston should theirs be. They have a long time in warning given them to see the evil and shun it. She's talking about the British, right? And then she says, um, by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose would be necessary for you to make I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. <laughs> if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice and no representation. What? Bravo, bravo. I was like, Abigail, <laughs> she was your girl, sister. It's 2018. We're at this table talking about pay equity or the pay inequity that still exists. We're talking about a time when um, the, the wages that people, wait, particularly in women, are poverty wages. In a, in a country that prides itself on being the richest, most powerful country in the world, that we have poverty, and that poverty is basically centered between women and children, is a shame and a moral sin against their own convictions and what they wrote in, in, the, in the Declaration of Independence, as well as the Constitution, which brings me to my point, because the Constitution of the United States says, we the people, in order for a more perfect union, more perfect union, come on sisters, a more perfect union, okay, it's a union, right, they understood, these men were educated, men, you know this, they understood exactly what they were talking about, they didn't say association, they didn't say organization, they said union, because they understood that 13 states was going out conducting business with their own currency and whatnot, that they could be picked off easily by the European powers from which they came. And so they said, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to join together and, and work this. We talked, you heard the statistics from both my sisters, uh, Carolyn and Elise, about the pay gaps and, and the, the, how unions balance that out, that unionized workers, male, female, people of color, earn more money than they would if they were in non-union. And I got the little chart here. I'm going to pass it around, y'all, so you can just 
take a look at it because it basically mm -hmm. says the same thing. And I know this came from your, is this your data? I got it from the AFL-CIO mm -hmm. Common Sense Economics, so I'll pass it. It's that the same data source. Uh -huh. so. Same yeah. data source, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so we know this. We know that unions have better, provided a, a higher standard of living and um, an opportunity heretofore unknown. My family is a perfect example. Coming up from the southern part of the United States, Georgia and Alabama, one generation away from slavery, went into the, my father went into the Fort Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan, and made money that nobody else, we thought we were rich. We really did. We didn't really, and then I thought we were middle class. And then I realized that we were just the working poor, just one paycheck away from poverty. But because of unions, because the United Automobile Workers organized and organized contracts so that my father, like most of the African American men who worked in that plant, worked in the nastiest and dirtiest jobs, still made enough money so that we could buy a home, so that we could be sent to college not on scholarships, by them paying out of their pocket, because that's, yeah. that's when college was affordable, and we thought it was expensive yeah. then. Mm -hmm. So we know that unions have made a big difference in many people's lives, whether you're in a union or not, because we brought up the wages for all workers. So when, they, when we talk about the, the data that uh, between 1980 and 2000 is when we saw the, the rapid um, uh, decline in the, in, the, in the wage gap, you look at that and you compare that with the with the, with the uh, data as uh, graphs that show union density, and then when union density starts going down, when you look at how wages are going were going, and then when wages started plateauing off and going less than the cost of living, and less than the productivity, you see that chart where the productivity is going up like this, cost of living is going up like this, union wages are going up, and then suddenly they start going down. It's around the same time, I think that we're looking at when the pay gap starts to slow. In 2000, is right? I'm looking at my sister's yep. again. In 2000, it starts to slow. Why? What would make the difference? The major difference is declining union leadership, deindustrialization, and the financialization of the economy of the United States of America. So, as young people, next generationers, and a lot of women are in, the, in work that is non-unionized, as we look at uh, the service sector, which is growing like crazy, as well as the technology sector, and we are, they have already pointed out that within um, Facebook, the, the, the leadership is predominantly white male, I believe, if not in totally white male, that that's what's going on. So while we're doing our work, and I really believe this is important, and, and the sisters around this table will help us in doing this, is that we really need to, because I am a teacher, get out and do the education and training. People simply don't have the information. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to get this data <laughs> on their Facebook page while they're exchanging recipes at the latest restaurant or out of family pictures. I'm all for it. It's a wonderful thing. It took me kicking and dragging to the 21st century. But now that I'm there, <laughs> I kind of like it. I, I catch up with people I didn't hear. But they're not going to get this information. And I don't think it's something that we need to tell people. We need to help people to discover it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, at least this year at our... Um, Coalition Labor Union Women uh, Leadership Conference, we're really focusing on not just you know providing workshops, but providing training that people will be able to do something afterwards. It's one thing for me to sit and listen to your lecture. It's another thing for me to participate in the learning process and do and gain skills and training that I can then move forward with. So we have to look at the political picture. We don't have any choice. I mean, not to mention the craziness that's going on in the White House right now and the rest of the uh, Congress. Um, but I am really excited about the number of women who are running for office. But it's not just enough to have women running for office, because, you know, it's like Thurgood Marshall said, you know, what's the difference between a white snake and a black snake? Nothing, they'll both bite you. Well, you know, <laughs> every woman ain't a feminist, and every woman ain't out there to make sure that women get ahead. So those of us, and not just ahead, because I don't want just what they got. I want to change the way we view and function in the world, the way work is done, the way that, so that, you know, uh, as we fought for an eight-hour day, there's, you could have a six-hour day. We could have a four-day work week. We can make sure that everybody, uh, male or female, mothers and fathers, or whatever you define yourself, or not define yourself by gender, uh, is able to spend time, that time that we know is absolutely essential in a young person's life to make sure that they have what they need in order to go forth in the world. So I am really excited 
about the work that's that's coming before us, and I really uh, look forward to what's going to happen in this year and in 2020 in terms of women and mobilization and bringing forth the young people. I know that um, what, what part of what's facing the labor movement is this right to work movement that's going on. Janice is, is part of it, and Connie's going to talk more to that. But in looking at, in doing my own work in, uh, on Janice and on right to work, and if you, if you study the history of right to work, it is rooted in racism. It's a racist concept. Absolutely. Vance Muse, who's the one who, you know, promoted it most, mm -hmm. but he got it from Mr. Ruggles, who was uh, editor of a, of a newsletter or something mm -hmm. in Texas, this all comes out of Texas, said, oh, oh, no, 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 black people and white people can't be together, that's just going to be a terrible thing, and they're going to be competing for jobs, so they he came up with the phrase right to work, but we know it means right to work for less, mm -hmm. really simply, and to right to work without union representation, because women have found, through collective bargaining, to be to pay equity. Women have found through collective bargaining to address the issue of sexual harassment mm -hmm. uh, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, so that we are stronger when, when we are unionized. And if you, if you show me a country that doesn't have a democratic labor movement, I will show you a totalitarian state. Mm -hmm. We are the backbone of democracy. We are part of what makes um, the playing field more even than it's been before. So I had this really great idea as I was listening to you talking, especially as Ellie was demurring about um, sharing about her life, is that we need the oral history project right here in this room with this group of people. Truly. And there is uh, a woman uh, whose name just went out of my head uh, who does this by having young people, high schoolers, interview mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? our uh, esteemed selves and then write about it and then, and then turn it into a poem or story and they perform it. It's a remarkable process. And when I sat down with the high school students, they were looking pretty bored and, and they didn't really have any questions for me. So I just started, taught, started babbling. And then one asked a question and another one got a little more courage and asked me another question. And I was like, okay, and I answered it. And when it was done, she sent me the book of what they created, the, the, the poems, which were actually raps, they were spoken word, hip hop, and uh, but also this, what they wrote about what they learned from what I said. It was a remarkable awakening to me. I mean, I had judged them. I said, well, you know, teenagers probably all waiting to get on their phones or something. They're not really interested in you know, an old fart like me has to say, but I was wrong. They were listening, and they took it, and they changed it into another art form. So I think that passing the stories, sharing our stories, if we don't tell it, nobody else will. It's part of the work that must be done. So I'm really excited about what we're going to be doing in the Coalition of Labor Union Women, what we can do collectively as women, and what this next generation of young people, hashtag March for Our Lives, are doing, and what, what's happening in our schools and with our teachers is absolutely, this is the time. And we are the leaders we've been looking for, and we're going to mentor that next generation of leaders to come who are already here and work together through generations. And I know this word is being used a lot. Intersectionality <laughs> of it all is coming together, and I'm grateful. So um, in the words of Bev Grant, we have plowed, we have planted, we have gathered into barns, done the same work as the men with babies in our arms. But you won't find our stories in most history books you read. We were there, we're still here, fighting Amen. for the things we need. We were there in the factories, we were there in the mills, we were there in the mines and came home to fix the meals. We were there on the picket line, we raised our voices loud. It makes me proud just knowing we were there. Thank you, sisters. Oh, yeah. For anyone who wasn't here today, shame on you. have missed the best of all. I don't know what you mean. Please, please, let me just say. You do not change the world when we whisper. Yes, you do. Thank you. 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 Thank
we change it when we roar. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you have not missed it because I have archived it. And I, I have done I have done fifty her stories. Carmen Del Vatico Vota is dead, but I have her story. Helen Bentley is dead, but I have her story. Really? Two hundred great blacks and wax shows. Okay? Good. And I have been archiving for fifty years. Oh, All right, so okay. it's not So you need not. to do the next brown bag on what you've done. No, oh. but I'm saying we are, we are, but yes. her story will be seen and, sent and put on TV. Her singing, everything, fantastic. So, All right, so I get to be the downer here, and I'm sorry, I apologize, but there's this thing called Janice versus Ask Me Local mm -hmm. Council 13, and it is the story of how manipulation through very rich people and rich interests, the 1%, can manipulate the workers and how we must fight against it. And every one of us must fight against it. We must teach our children and our grandchildren to fight against it. The case in point here is actually a fight to reverse something called a Abood versus the Detroit Board of Education. And this was a case that was decided in 1977 that, in fact, people don't have to belong to the union in a, in a shop that's unionized. What they have to do is pay the fair, um, what we call fair, um, Sure. What is a fair, fair share, yeah. fair, fair share, share. Mm -hmm. of what would be charged for the people who do the negotiation of the contract elements for them. They don't have to pay money into the political things. That's fine. Well, Mark Janis decided, he's a child social worker in Illinois, and he decided that, in fact, if he paid any money into it, it was all going to go for political purposes because a union is a political animal. Well, actually, unions have a schizophrenic life, and they aren't all political, and the part he was paying for wasn't. But at any rate, what we're, what we're seeing here is a fight against Abood versus Detroit um, Board of Education. And that one upheld, of course, the maintaining of a union shop in a public workplace and set the right to collect what we call fair share dues. So the influence of the Koch brothers, the people who brought us the American States mm -hmm. Legislative Exchange Council, and the right to work, uh, this is actually an attack on the ability of the 99% to achieve and maintain that comfortable existence that we were talking about. We're not talking about being kings and queen and rich people, but a decent life, the ability to buy a house, to own a car, to send children to college or post-secondary education that puts those kids on a career path that will also assure their comfort. Um, the term right to work, of course, as Dr. Martin Luther King noted, is a false slogan. Because wherever it is in, enacted, wages are lower, job opportunities are less accessible and fewer, and there are no civil rights because in right-to-work states, we're not worried about doing civil rights. So what is the only organized body that speaks out for workers? And that's organized labor. So what, just what has labor done for workers? Well, it gives you a voice at work that talks about working conditions. It gave us the weekends. It gave us paid leave and retirement. It gave us the ability to look at ourselves with dignity in the jobs that we do, no matter how small or how large they are. It also brought us workplace integration by race and gender and ethnicity. Labor unions have played a historic role in integrating the workforce. Think about the migration of poor black Southerners, as Elise was talking about. As a matter of fact, Elise, I was thinking about your parents when I wrote this, because we've talked about this before. Those that migrated to the industries in the north, in, in, in Pennsylvania, in the steel mills, in Chicago, in the, in the various industries that were there, in the auto industry in Detroit, where I come from, all of those things, the economic boom that those unionized jobs created for black people, and for black women in particular, those who belong to unions make 30% more than those that don't. And while black women earn 65 cents on every dollar, I think you said it's 68 now, it's probably mm -hmm. going up, this is a couple years old, um, <laughs> earned by white men, that wage gap is 20% smaller for women who are in unions. 20% smaller. So who wouldn't belong to a union? I mean, that's just plain common economic sense. Unions also were a unified place to push for legislative reforms for worksite safety and health. Would we still have young ladies in the radium factories painting dials on watches and dying of cancer because they did not know what they were doing with those things and other things also? Um, 
The National Women's Law Center tells us that unions are associated with smaller wage gaps related to gender and race in part because they promote transparency in criteria and decisions on compensation, recruitment, and promotions. Without transparency, all the good things are hidden. So, Gender-based wage gaps persist through the economy, but the wage gap for union members is 53% smaller than the wage gap among non-union workers. Who will, who will be most affected by the decision that bans unions from, changing, from charging fair share costs and forces unions to do re-sign-up of their members every year? Well, the target here, of course, is the public sector employee, 17 million of them to be exact. Almost 18% of them are black women and almost 12% are black men. Black women also face a double pay gap, a gender pay gap and a racial pay gap. For unionized Latino public sector workers, their pay is 51% higher than non-unionized Latino workers. So you see what a tremendous, because they are, at this point, I think Native Americans may be the very lowest pay mm -hmm. um, gap. Uh, they have the largest gap. But that's because of a lot of socioeconomic factors associated with tribal law and living on reservations. Um, so these tickets, th these jobs are a ticket to the middle class, the American dream, and their effect is not just within unions, but in communities. Because where unionized workers live and work, they rose the boat for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, one employer can't pay less when there's a union employer that's paying more. Well, what are we going to do when this decision comes down? There are four ways that this decision can go. The first is they reverse the ruling on Abood versus Detroit. I never realized, I thought this was like baptism and religion at birth, that you could change a Supreme Court decision. It never occurred to me. Of course, it should have, because we're always talking about the danger to Roe v. Wade, right? But it never occurred to me that you could actually have a court that would do that. So if they reverse that Abood versus Detroit, um, starting from the day of the decision, unions cannot collect the fair shares. And in fact, if they do collect fair share fees, they could be held up as doing criminal things because they're taking money for which they are not entitled. OK? So there's that. And uh, they must still represent, because of US labor law, they must still represent everyone that's in the working unit, whether they're in the union or not, mm -hmm. because that's the law. OK? So we're going to have a lot of free riders, folks. That's what I think. And in fact, I know for a fact that Coke and the American Legislative Exchange and the uh, right to work people are going to be going around. They're already gearing up to go around people's houses and say, give yourself a $1,200 pay raise this year. Drop your union. They're still going to have to represent you, but just go right ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that we have been doing enough on our organizing campaigns that people will see through this and recognize that that is no deal at all. The other thing that could happen is the courts uphold the Abood versus Detroit, where fair share could still be collected, but, but they suggest changing the ways that membership is defined and fees are collected, which would still cut down on the membership and cut down on the amount of monies, probably, that go to unions. This may be a respite, in a sense, but we know, just as there was Friedrichs before uh, Janus, there's going to be another case or two or three or four or five. They've got them lined up because this is the way that they are going to fight the battle. So we know those groups are coming behind and that there's going to be another. A third way is that the court dismisses Janice versus ASME as what they call an improvidently granted case, which means those dummies down below shouldn't have sent it up to us and we're not going to rule on it. That is probably pretty unlikely. But in that case, Abood lives. But again, we know that there are groups coming up that are going to challenge it again, because these people cannot take no for an answer, just like the person living at 1,645. Mm -hmm. uh, we know, too, that there's another way it could go, and that is that SCOTUS specifically could uphold the Abood ruling, effectively putting the challenge in abeyance, saying that, yes, Abood is held. And if, in fact, that court does that, and knowing how long justices are on this court, they could then give up and try to find another way to do it. But in the meanwhile, what are we planning to do? Well, I can tell you I'm in charge of the National Allies call for decision day. If that comes down, whatever happens, wherever I am, I have to go back to the office and institute a call for about 250 people who are in allied organizations to the four unions that are the partners on this. Those four unions are AFSCME, uh, AFT, NEA, and SEIU. Those are the four. 
that are the partners. And we will be convening a call and we will be putting out a toolkit which has all kinds of social media uh, campaigns and press releases. We're going to have a vigorous organizing campaign. We're going to be seeking legislative relief in the states. And we're going to be looking at judicial appointments to the Supreme Court with an even harder look. Because I don't know if anybody's been watching. We kind of play a shell game here in D.C. The president starts making noise about this, this, and this, and on the side, they're doing something else. So, you know, don't look under the shell. Don't look under the hand. So, um, we, we need to be looking at those. There are several groups that are formed into a judicial noms committee, which we keep track of and watch every day. So now I'm going to turn this over for all of the questions you guys may have been storing up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What a panel. Fantastic presentations. I have one good news case that I'd like to learn more about. What about the recent decision that said that they can't look at past pay and offering jobs? Ah, yes. Not only that, but another good news case, New Jersey passed equal pay today. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yes, we don't know exactly what that means, but it's their version. So what about that case? That's a wonderful case that says, finally, we have a way that we can establish a standard, and that standard is not the past pay. It's actually the performance of the duties that you've done, how well you've done them, et cetera. You can't be looking at people's past pay now to set pay. Yes, Holly? Um, do you know what states are right to work states off the top of your head? Uh, no, not off the top of my head, but I'll send you a list. But, okay. There's Oklahoma, 27 of them. Oklahoma and Texas, do you know? Oh, yes, honey. Right to work, just like Virginia. Both. In okay. Oklahoma and Texas? Because we organize there. I, and you know, those those states that are right to work, where unions have been organizing, we face this battle, and we've already sort of overcome this battle. Yeah. So now what we have to do is say to those states like New York, like uh, Maryland, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, like the district even, I guess, because this is not right to work. They have union bargaining here. And Look at this model. Just that uh, Maryland, we just overcame some of the yes. legislation on the right to work. Right, they tried to Maryland pass a right is to work. Strong right now. Yeah, right. So I just wanted to share. I, I heard. Have you ever heard of Mike Elk? He writes for unions, and he so he he was speaking about going to the various. He works for the Guardian in his own separate oh. private, mm -hmm. and he went and marched with a big labor person and marched from with the teachers from going from Oklahoma City to Tulsa. And I paid a lot of attention because I'm from Oklahoma. And I just wondered if if the further you get from good schools, the further you are from demanding good schools because you've never been to one. You know, I just, I kind of wonder about that. But anyway, the point is, I was going to say that in Oklahoma, and, I, and this dawned on me too. It's an oil rich state. What mm -hmm. happened? Why are schools so bad? I just. It Where is the money it. going? Yes. Follow so the money. So he said mm -hmm. that Oklahoma taxes its oil 3.9%, where, by contrast, Texas 8%. So Oklahoma teachers are going in droves to Texas yes. because they start at $20,000 more. I'm just parroting yeah. what he said. I, I well, know. the same yeah. thing happens yeah. between Fairfax and Montgomery mm -hmm. County right mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Montgomery is way more than yeah. Fairfax? Believe it or not. It used to be much more even, but Fairfax no. hasn't kept Fairfax up. Fairfax has not kept up. And oh. it, it's not as though we haven't been asking for it, but nobody wants to pass those bond issues. Okay. You know, I've never seen a bond issue I didn't like. And so because so it always people means who were here last week, at uh, last month, I just wanted to share. We had a speaker who was a descendant of Frederick Douglass, and she just out of the clear blue says, "What would have happened if people had paid attention to Anita Hill?" It makes you wonder if people had paid attention to Abigail. Adams. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, or sure. now, or uh, all these things that we have these touch points that we're just kind of going. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are there other questions? Well, I wanted to add something. Uh, my son is deputy director of AFSCME where this happened. <laughs> and um, I talked to him and Lee Saunders, the head of AFSCME, yeah. and the general counsel, you know, all these people. Of course, uh, my son said they sent loads of people out, and, and Lee Saunders told me they sent people there too to register people for this other part. And so they that gives them, in a sense, a, 
Yes, what we're having to do is re-sign up people. So what that's they were doing the, that's was collecting doing. the signature saying, yes, it's all right for this person to deduct pay, or in fact, signing them up to do it through their own checking accounts or yeah, credit cards. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So that was helpful. But on the yeah. other hand, everybody seems to feel very much defeated already. Well, I don't think we should feel defeated. We just must look on the this. General we're women. We see this as another challenge. <laughs> okay, right, the know. general counsel said to me, I'm optimistic. I'm not, the, even though she wouldn't. Yes, I've spoken with her. Yeah. 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 So, so we also should thank George, uh, George Washington, because it was George and Martha, and they, and like Abigail and whatever, John. they brought their wives into the phone, into making decisions. It, it was an article in obituary for Barbara Bush that she was so influential. She was. But, when, but you know, became George and Martha immediately. So there were women under the beginning of the United States with that, who had a voice. And a we civility, a civility we miss dearly right, these right, days. Right.